Great. So it's uh, my pleasure to have uh, Dor Minzer today uh, from the Institute of Advanced Studies, uh, who will talk about uh, some uh, really exciting results uh, about uh, applications of uh, about chart thresholds and their applications in extreme occlusion. So uh, thank you, Andre. Uh, so I don't know how questions work in this seminar, but if anyone has a question, please uh, don't hesitate. Uh, so I'm going to talk about new sharp threshold results and some applications in extreme combinatorics. So this talk is based on joint works with Peter Givash, Noam Lifshitz, and Owen Long. Uh, and, and it's supposed to be like elementary. So I, mean, I don't assume that you know anything about Boolean functions or anything like that. So, uh, so this is the plan. So first we'll see some uh, basic, basic notions, basic definitions about Boolean functions. And then we'll discuss some uh, existing threshold results, and then some new ones. And finally, I'll tell you some of the connection to extremal combinatorics. Uh, namely, uh, we'll talk about the Erdős matching conjecture and uh, some related uh, problems. Good. Uh, so, so in this talk, like uh, we're going to care about the Boolean hypercube. Uh, namely the set of uh, vectors of length n uh, that uh, have zero one entries. And sort of towards the end of the talk, we'll also think about it as the collection of subsets of n. So we'll think of these two objects as the same thing. And first of all, we want to define some interesting probability distributions over the hypercube. And for us, we'll care about the p biased measures. Uh, that are defined for each parameter p between 0 and 1. So we define this measure as mu p, and it is defined by assigning each vector x the weight, which is p, to the number of 1s in x times 1 minus p to the number of zeros in x. So perhaps more intuitively, if you want to sample x according to mu p, what we do is, for each coordinate, you flip a p by a coin. And that's how we sample from this distribution. So just note that for p equals half, this is the uniform distribution. So this is the measures that we care about in this talk. And what we study, well, the basic object we study are Boolean valued functions, namely functions from 0, 1 to them to 0, 1. Good. Uh, so what can you ask about such functions? So in the next couple of minutes, I will uh, tell you about like, some sort of a pretty central problem about Boolean functions. We will see some answers, and then we'll see some connections to other uh, problems. And so let's define some notions. So this is the definition of influences. So suppose we have a function f, and we have some variable i. And we have some bias parameter, p. So the influence of variable i with respect to the p bias measure on f is defined as the probability that sampling an x according to mu p, the variable i makes a difference on the output of f. Namely, if I look at the value of f at x, and I look at the value of f at x when I flip the i coordinate, I get two different results. Okay, so this is uh, the influence of a variable, and we also define the total influence of a function to be the sum of all of these individual influences. Okay, so, so this is a, a kind of the most basic notion you can come up with. And here is a question. Uh, 
Uh, suppose I have some function f. And I tell you that its total influence is small. Uh, okay, so so let's let's make, make some conventions. So for this talk, we'll always have p, which is the stuff. Okay. Okay. So I have some function f, and I have some bias parameter p between zero and half. And I tell you that the total influence is smaller. And it turns out that the correct normalization for this question is to say that p times the total influence is small. Okay. What can you tell me about f? Okay. So this is, uh, I'm telling you this is a very kind of central question. And soon I will try to explain to you why it is connected to at least like uh, several uh, different fields. But before that, let, let's uh, examine some examples. So let's fix the equals half to be more convenient. So uh, the first example is a dictatorship. This is the name of the example. And it's a very simple function. It's the function that looks at uh, the, the input vector x and decides what is the output only according to the first coordinate. So like one is the dictator. So what is the total influence in this case? Well. Uh, you can clearly see that no other variable except one matters because it, it has no influence on the output of f. So it's very easy to see that the total influence of f is one because the influence of the first variable is one and uh, and zero or any other value. Good. So let's slightly generalize it. So what happens when f is not a dictatorship, but maybe it depends only on 10 variables. So Well, in this case, following similar logic, you can show that at most k of the influences are not zero. So you can show that the total influence is at most k. Okay. And finally, an example of a slightly different flavor is the majority example. namely the function that looks at an input x and outputs one, if and only if at least half of the bits are one. Okay. So it, it's, it's a computation, but you can do it. You can show that the time influencing is this case is actually very large. Asymptotically, it's like square root of n. Okay, so, so let's look at these uh, examples. So in the first two examples, we have small total influence. Uh, because say we think of k as constant as standard. Whereas in the last example, it is large. So it makes sense to sort of guess that maybe examples of the form one and two are the only examples we have. Well, uh, this is partially true, but the story gets a little more uh, interesting. So it turns out that you sort of need to consider two different regimes of P. 
So there is the unbiased regime, where P is bounded away from 0 and 1. So you can think of P equals half, for example. It doesn't matter. Everything is kind of the same. And you can think of the bias case, where is close to 0 or 1, say it's close to 0. And here, uh, it can turn out that the answer is completely different. Okay, so, so does it make sense? Uh, good. So, so, uh, so I have this question. I'll soon tell you what is known. First, uh, as I promised, I want to uh, connect it to some uh, other problems. So, um, maybe, maybe let's give it a name. Question one. So question one, it turns out to be related and to various different fields. So for example, it is related to theoretical computer science and more specifically uh, to me, to, to PCP and hardness of approximation. Uh, it is related to external combinatorics. Uh, but most importantly, for, this, for the purpose of, of this talk, it is related to the study of sharp thresholds. Okay. So I want to quickly elaborate on this last uh, point. So what is sharp thresholds? Okay. So what is sharp thresholds? Well, here, the setup is that, again, we have some Boolean function. Uh, this time we assume that it is monotone, meaning if we have two inputs x and y, and x i is at most y i for each coordinate, then f of x is most f of y. Okay. Uh, so we have a monotone function, and what we want to study is the behavior of this uh, monotone function under different p bias measures. So what is the most basic thing you can ask? Well, you can ask, what is the expectation of f until each one of these bias measures? Okay. So we want to study it, and more specifically, we want to understand how the graph of this uh, fun of, of this mapping from t p to mu p of f, how does it behave? So, uh, roughly speaking, it can take one of the following two forms. So, we have our axis here, so this is the p axis, and this is the mu p axis. Yeah, so, so I want to now draw two possible graphs for this mapping. And there are sort of, uh, uh, there is sort of one thing that is already clear. So because the function is monotone, you can see that if you increase p, the probability of f being one can only increase. So this, this graph will also always be increasing. And what we want to know is, does it in increase sharply or does it increase slowly? So what is slowly? Well, slowly is kind of like, say, a linear line, maybe something like that. So this is what, what we call a coarse threshold. And, and kind of the opposite of being coarse is being sharp. 
So it means that you kind of stay the same for a while, then suddenly you jump to one, and then you stay at one. So, so this is what sharp thresholds are all about. And if you've seen any kind of result in a random, a random graph theory, or really anything in a, the probability method, you might have seen a, such behavior of uh, functions, for example, of graph properties. Uh, yeah, so how do we prove, uh, how do we tell whether a fun given function has a sharp threshold or a coarse threshold? Well, we want to study the rate of increase of mu p of f. So in other words, we want to study this derivative. Okay? And if it is small, then we can say that uh, the function has a coarse threshold. And if it's big, we can say that it is a sharp threshold. So, Good. So we concluded that to study sharp thresholds, what we really need to do is to study this derivative. And it so happens that this derivative is exactly equal to the total inference of f. And so this is uh, known as the Rousseau-Margulis lemma. Uh, uh, can I ask you a small question or a, sure. rather a request? Maybe you can give, uh, for those people who are not familiar, a couple of examples from random graphs uh, to illustrate it, maybe, or something. Yeah, mm. good. Um, yeah, so let's, talk, let's look back at uh, maybe the example. So let's at like another example. Uh, so let's say our input x is an adjacency matrix of a graph. Okay, it is 0, 1 to the n choose 2. Okay. Then, for example, your function could be f of x is equal to 1 if and only if the graph described by x is connected. Okay. Um, so this is a, an example of a, like one problem from random graph theory, but really, once you see that, you can imagine any problem uh, cast in this language. Uh, and then the question of uh, sharp thresholds really relate to what edge density do I need to guarantee that uh, I have a connectivity or I have a I don't know, large click or I don't know what. Okay. Um, good, so does it answer the question, Andre? Yeah, I think I think it's good. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good. So so let's recap for a moment because uh, it's uh, I've said uh, kind of many things. So we started with this uh, kind of uh, weird looking question. I defined some notions of influences, but I hope that I convinced you that at least indirectly it comes up naturally in uh, other places or kind of more precisely at least in a uh, one other place. Good, so now that we are motivated, I can tell you what is known about this question. Uh, so this is like two for my plan. So far, uh, yeah. And so as I said, uh, in this business, there are two regimes you can you can discuss. There are the p bounded from zero and one, which is much better understood. And then there is the case where p is either close to zero or one, which is more complicated. So let's start with this regime. So here is a theorem. So this is a really important result due to can Kalai linear. So this theorem says that uh, if f uh, if you have an f and p 
And let's assume that f is not constant. Let's assume that uh, the probability is one, is it most like, uh, let's be, let's assume the probability is one, is it most like 0 0.99, and at least 0 0.01. Uh, so what the result says that if the total inference is small, then your function resembles the dictatorship at least kind of uh, uh, with small probability. Namely, there exists a variable i that has relatively large inference. Okay, so, so this is a, a really influential result, uh, pun intended. Um, but it's really only the beginning of the story because, okay, you have one influential variable, but can you say more? And it turns out yes, and it actually uh, it doesn't take like, more, much more effort than the KKL theorem. So this is a result of Friedhut. So he showed the following uh, statement. He showed that not only are there variables with high influence, but in fact, the function nearly only depends on these variables. So under the same uh, conditions, uh, you get that f essentially depends on it most exponentially in k variables. Okay. Uh, good, and, and uh, yeah, at this point you may ask yourself, okay, is this the end of the story? Because uh, there is some gap between this result that we've seen here that shows k variables, uh, but actually this turns out to be tight. Uh, Uh, yeah, so this is so these are two very nice theorems. Uh, is that if you have small data inference, then it means that you have local structure. So clearly this is not a theorem, this is a meta theorem. Uh, but you can see how the previous two results fit into it. Because local he here only means that it depends. Oh yeah, so there was a question. If essentially depends mean only depends. Uh, so, uh, so what essentially depends? Well, I mean that there exists a function G. That depends on it most. It must uh, that many variables, and it's close to f. Okay, so so this is what I mean by essentially depends. Uh, good. So. Uh, so yeah, so this is uh, the method theory and the two specific results. And okay, but sometimes we are interested in p that is either close to zero or close to one. As in the case, for example, in external combinatorics or in sharp thresholds. So for example, uh, uh, if you look at this connectivity example, the p's that you care about are, sub, uh, are going to zero with n. Uh, like uh, like log n over n. 
So you cannot use uh, FreeDoot or uh, KKL to analyze such functions. And this occurs very often in, uh, when you try to apply it in, in uh, combinatorics. So we want to get something for P that is close to one, zero, close to one. Okay. Or maybe it would be good if you say a word about why you multiply it by p in the meta theorem. Um, yeah, so I, I hoped to avoid uh, this <laughs> this point. So, uh, but but uh, if you ask, then uh, I'll say it. So, when we say something as a sub threshold, we mean that it occurs at a point p, and the window that it is occurred is proportional to p at least one plus epsilon times p and one minus epsilon times p. And it turns out that if you want to study such windows that are proportional to p, then you need to multiply by p. So this is the reason uh, we always multiply by p. But, uh, but of course, for, for p that is bounded away from 0 and 1, you can ignore it. And also for the dictatorship, uh... Right, it would be the influence would be what would be the influence for the dictatorship in at point P? No, it's, it's still one, it's still one. Yeah. Okay. okay, good. Thank you, Andre. Uh, yeah, good. So, what about P that is small? So, the first guess. is that uh, maybe this theorem still hold. Maybe, uh, so let me uh, introduce uh, a notion here. So functions that depend on a little amount of variables, I'm going to call them a junta. Okay, so and, uh, and then uh, this theorem of free dot is called the free dot junta theorem. Uh, so the first conjecture would be that any function, even in small p, is a junta. Uh, but this is false. And actually, we will work this in uh, sort of a hint of, ex of an example. Um, so, for example, you can take f of x to be an O of uh, one of p variables. Uh, you can show that the influence here, the influence here is small, but it, it's not a junta. Right? It depends on one over p variables. So, you need to come up with uh, a new conjecture. And indeed, Friedut did come up with a conjecture. Uh, and not to put it in some cases, but I don't want to phrase things too precisely. So instead, I'll take you, tell you some other results. So, so as I said, there are some results by Friedhoff. Uh, there is a result by Bougain. There is one by Khatami. Uh, so I, I don't want to spend too much time on it, so I'll not tell you like each one of them what it says, I'll only tell you what does Bourgain say, because uh, this is the most relevant to us. So here is the result. Suppose we have a function. This is a function. Suppose p is small. I don't need it to be small. It works for any p. Uh, suppose the function is not too biased. And suppose I have small protein forms. Then you get some locality. 
then there exist a small set of variables such that if I take these variables and I fix them to one, the average of my function increases by a lot. Meaning, if I look at the function where I restrict these variables all to, all to one, so I'll soon define formally, then suddenly my measure increases by a lot. I measure at least what it used to be plus e to the minus k squared. So if r restricted to one is a function that is defined on the rest of the bits, Uh, and it is defined in, in, this, in the natural way. Okay. Uh, so, so let's start at this result uh, for a little while. So what, what do we say? How does it fit to the meta, meta theorem? So the meta theorem says that uh, if your total inference is small, then you have a local structure. And what is the local structure here? Well, the local structure is that you can fix constantly many variables and make a large difference in your function. Okay. So you should really compare this result to the KKR theorem that told you that here there is a single variable that uh, makes a lot, a lot of difference on the function. So th these are really two analogs, uh, except that here we have to take a larger set, but still of constant size, and instead of e to the minus k, we get e to the minus k squared. Okay. Great. So, so this is the result of Bogan, it's, uh, it's very nice. Uh, but it has uh, two soft spots. It has two drawbacks that, uh, that, are really, uh, that are really hurting it, in the sense that if it didn't have it, it would be much more useful. Uh, so there are two points, that, or maybe three points, that, uh, One may hope to improve. So the first one is this gap of e to the minus k squared versus e to the minus k. So uh, this is a little bit of a technical one. It's, it's uh, asking whether the bound as in the KKL theorem is correct, or, uh, or maybe suddenly you need to lose uh, another square. Uh, that would be tight. So that's the first concern. The second concern, which is actually much more serious, is that this theorem does not apply for functions that are sparse. And as we we'll see uh, later on in the talk, this is really the situation that comes up in extremal combinatorics when you want to determine the two numbers of some problems. What, what you're really asking for is uh, small sets and not uh, large sets. Uh, yeah, and finally, you can hope to get like a better uh, qualitative result. Uh, so the last point, as I said, there is a result of Khatami. He sort of answered it, but uh, only in a very kind of weak sense. Uh, 
And well, good. So, so these are the three points you can hope to improve in Bugain's theorem. And, and the result that uh, we obtained sort of resolves the first two points. So let me uh, say our result, let me say one corollary, and then we'll take a break. So here's theorem with Kivas, uh, Lifshitz, Long, and myself. Uh, so the result says the following, suppose, they want to learn to zero one, and satisfies that it's not too close to one. And uh, the total influence is small. But here, small has to be uh, compared to the measure of F. Then, uh, there exists a small set of variables. Such that if you fix them to one, you get a huge increase. You get your measure to be at least e to the minus k. Okay. So this is the result. It holds for uh, any any function f, even if it's it has a small measure. And uh, and yeah, so 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 it uh, in particular gives you uh, like this first point and also the second point. But uh, it takes a little while. It takes a little while to understand why this is uh, like a good answer to point B. Uh, so let me tell you like one immediate corollary that perhaps sorry the increment should be e to minus k um yeah so so sort of so okay so i, I wrote it down this theory now when you should think of uh, the, the measure of f to be small okay so so yeah you, you can write down something like this but e to the minus k is like much more, uh, it's much larger than up of f when we care about it. So, uh, yeah, so the typical case would be when this k will be like, say, 1 over 10 times log 1 over mu p. Okay. So that's like a, a typical setting that will be interesting for us. And then this is like a, a power less than half of the measure, so it's much larger. Okay, so let me tell you a corollary, uh, which is a kind of a, well, at least for me, you start seeing whether this is useful. So here's a corollary. It's it's an immediate corollary. It's nothing uh, nothing special. Uh, okay, let's set it a bit more precisely. So the corollary, informally speaking, says the following. If you have f this sparse, then if you want to increase its measure, you can always do it in one of the two ways. By either Restricting constantly many variables. Okay, it's monotonous. Also, also yeah. restricting constantly many variables to one, or increasing p from p to one plus a little bit times p. So let me be a bit more precise. So uh, for every alpha and epsilon greater than zero, there exists some gamma and R 
such that if f is sparse, then then uh, either there exists. Okay. Maybe instead of R, let's say K. No. Either there exists a small set of variables such that if I fix this to one, I get a bump by factor one over epsilon. B. If I increase P slightly from P to 1 plus alpha times P, then I can bump the measure by factor 1 over epsilon. Okay. So this is a corollary that should seem, I don't know if, you, if you've seen some results in external commodorics or in the junta method, this should start making sense because increasing measures Oftentimes, in this question, is something very desirable, and this uh, corollary gives you a very uh, general statement about when you can do it. Okay, so I propose that we take like a five-minute break now, and after the break, I will show you how you use. I will talk about the matching conjecture, and I will show you how you can use this corollary to get some new results about it. Uh, yeah, so let's take a five minute break. Or oh, maybe there are some questions before the break. Are there any questions? Okay. Okay, okay. We, we know that there is a sharp to shot. Does this theorem help us to find the crit critical probability? Where, where yeah. the critical probability? No? Uh, yeah, so this is something also that you can hope to do with it. So, so far we, we don't have any concrete example of where it helped us to find the critical probability, but certainly it's something that, that is possible. Um, yeah. So, any other questions? Yeah, so if not, we let's, uh, okay, let's take a break. Okay, there is some. Sorry, and in this corollary, uh, you have explicit dependence of uh, parameters. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I don't remember it off the top of my hand, but uh, it, it's, uh, it's not too bad. Okay, okay so let's, uh, yeah, let's take a five minutes break. Okay. Yeah, so, so let's continue. Uh, so, so in the first part of the talk, we talked about sharp thresholds, and uh, we had this uh, corollary. So now we are going to forget about it for 30 minutes, and discuss about something else, and then finally I'll, say, I'll tell you that everything is connected. Good, so what is the Erdos matching connection? So we have uh, three parameters, N, K, and S, such that N is at least k times s, and we have a family of subsets of size k. So this is the question, how large can f be if it does not contain matching of size s that is s sets that are pairwise disjoint So, so, so this is the, the question. 
And if you think about this question uh, for a little bit, then you can come up with uh, some examples. Uh, actually, you can come, come up with two examples. Both of them are sort of based on the pigeonhole principle. So the first example is you take all subsets of size k that contain at least one of the first s minus one elements. Okay. Uh, so you, you can see that this uh, set does not contain an S matching because what? <laughs> yes, I don't know. I don't know who is writing something on the board, but it wasn't me. Um. Uh, yeah. So so you can see that this set does not contain an S matching. Because if you have S sets, at least two of them will contain the same element from S minus one. And another example is the collection of sets that are contained in KS minus one. So again, by similar pigeon principle, principle, you can show that any S sets in it are not pairwise disjoint. And the conjecture made by, made by Ersch says that for any setting of parameters, uh, one of these sets is the extremal family. So if f is free of NS matching, then it size at most the maximum size of S1. And S2. Okay. Uh, good. So I should say a word here. So uh, you have these two examples, and one of them beats the other, given that n is sufficiently large compared to a K and S. Uh, so if n is at least, say, 1.01 .01 times ks, then you can show that s1 is larger than s2. Um, and actually, this is the only regime that we care about in this talk. When, so when you know? say that, sorry, there, when you say that it's larger, you mean uh, k is fixed and s is uh, s is large, right? Yeah, so I assume that k and s like going to infinity. Mm -hmm. Oh, maybe, maybe it's enough that s goes to infinity. Yeah, I, I'm not. Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, good. So, what is known about this conjecture? Well. So, uh, so it was first shown by others that uh, if n is large enough as some function of k and s, then, uh, then the conjecture holds. And it was later shown, let me see that I get the reference correctly. And oh, they can not so. Bolovas, they can and others. Uh, they sort of made this n zero explicit, and they showed that given that n is at least like say three times uh, k to the third s, then EMC holds. Uh, 
this was improved by uh, Wang Law uh, and Sudakov uh, to an at least three k squared times s. And uh, the last result is by uh, Frankel and uh, Kupavsky, uh, who showed that it holds for at least, I think, call it me if I'm wrong, uh, 5 over 3 times ks. Uh, yeah. So, so, so this is that Peter Peter was in between. Two cases. Uh, oh yeah, so I, I must have made like uh, ten other walks, but uh, but yeah, uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, so so this is what what is known about this conjecture. So strictly speaking, we don't we do not make any progress in that respect. So our result uh, are uh, kind of for a different problem. But for this problem, they can establish in a different way that it holds provided that n is at least some large content sign as s times ks. Uh, but, but actually, this is not uh, kind of the interesting point about it. Uh, the point here is that it works for a more general problem, uh, namely for the cross version of the problem that I'll soon define. And this allows us to uh, use it in other places to make some progress on uh, some other problems. Yeah. So what is the cross version? Let me see that I'm not. Yeah. Uh, more references. Yeah. So the course version was introduced by uh, Ronnie and Howard, and also by uh, this work of. Uh, Wang, Lo, and Sudakov. And at least as far as uh, uh, this HLS work is concerned, uh, the motivation to study it was to establish this result, to improve the, the cases uh, in which uh, EMC holds. So what is the cost version? So here you have S families. You ask, and you ask the following. Suppose these families are cross free. Of S matching. That is you don't you cannot choose one set from each family with all these joints. Then uh, what can you say about the family in, in uh, among F1 to FS of minimum size? More specifically, then the minimum, the minimum family among this uh, collection is at most uh, this famous maximum between the two examples that we have. Okay, so, so this is the cost version of the problem. And you can clearly see that this is a more general problem because if you care about a single family, you can just let each f each one of the FIs to be 
that family. But considering this problem gives you uh, more flexibility for, uh, for other applications, and this is why HLS considered it. And they proved the following result. Uh, if n is at least three times k squared s and f1 to fs are three matching, then the minimal amount there is it most this s1. Okay. Uh, good. So now I can finally tell you uh, what our result is uh, with respect to the Erdős matching connection. So we can pull uh, the following results. So uh, if n is at least a large constant times k s, then the cross version of the Erdős matching conjecture holds. That's one thing. And secondly, we have stability. If and it is at least k times s. Uh, all of the families are not uh, very much smaller than the external family. And they are cross free of matching. Then there is a copy of S1 that they are all close to. Finally, and I'm not going to uh, state it precisely, but uh, we get more general uh, hunt approximation results. And also we get, uh, we're able to study more general questions than uh, matchings, uh, namely expanded epigraphs. And um, yeah, so for for the fourth point, actually, it's really important that we manage to study the cross version. So this is kind of at least one one uh, one reason to be interested in cross versions of uh, such problems. Yeah. So in the rest of my time, I'd like to tell you a little bit of about how this proofs, or at least how this uh, Bolobach and uh, Dykin Erdős proof works. Uh, what is the extra ingredient that Wang, uh, Wang Lo, and Sudakov uh, put into the mix? And finally, uh, how we get our improvement and how sharp thresholds all relate to the story. One small thing. Do you maybe want to say a couple of words about what is an expanded hypergraph or it's not, it's out of the way? So, so not now. So, uh, okay. maybe if there are any questions in the end of the talk because I, I, okay. I prefer to show the connection. Sure. Good.
Yeah. So, uh, how do you prove something about the Erdos matching connection? So let's see what title I used for uh, for this. Uh, okay. I don't know why it's writing so poorly. Yeah. So, so what is what is this uh, Borobash and uh, Diking Erdos proof show? Uh, well, it proceeds. Maybe there is kind of uh, the following. So you have your collection of sets F, and you uh, consider the degrees of the vertices in it. And what you show is following. So if there is V of high degree. So I don't want to say precisely what high means, I only want to convey the general idea. Then what you do is you look at the family F prime, which, con which contains uh, all sets. Uh, in uh, n minus one choose k that are inside f and uh, maybe let's do it more precisely. So what you do is you consider all elements of f that do not contain v. Okay, so you do that. Then you need to do some counting. You need to show that assuming f is large, F prime is also larger, so that you can pull, you can uh, use the induction hypothesis to find a matching zero. Okay, so so this proof is by induction. Uh, so good, so we have this matching, uh, and we know that this matching does not contain the vertex V. Uh, then, count the number of uh, subsets of side K that contain V and some element from these edges that we find, that we found. And so let's, let's say that the high degree is something. And what you do is you choose the parameter D so that when you do this counting, this is at most D minus one. So we inducted, we removed V from our family, we found an S minus one matching, and we, uh, by counting, we show that the number of sets that contain V and one of the elements from the matching is less than the degree of V. So uh, there exists some A that contains V and this joint from of the one to a s minus one. Good. So this is so this is how this proof proceeds, and uh, what determines when it works is this uh, interplay between what degree you need to take, and uh, n and k and s. And this proof, uh, if you do it carefully, what it gives you is that it works as long as n is at least 
and k to the 3 times s. And uh, you can, it's not too difficult to, to see what d is, but I uh, prefer not to do it. So this is the idea in a Bolobash, Daikin, and Erdos. Good. So what did uh, Wang do in Sudakov do? So they said the following. Well, maybe we don't have a, a, a vertex with very high degree. But then it is enough to find many vertices, like S minus one vertices, also S vertices, that have moderately high degree. Then again, you get induct. So formally, you look at all sets where you remove this V1 to Vs. And once you add VI, you enter the family F. So you can uh, look at the families and you can induct on them. And this is sort of the reason they look at the cross version, because here you uh, very naturally get S different families. Okay, so this is a sort of the, the new additional idea. So then they take this idea, they combine it with the previous idea of uh, Bolobash, uh, Deikin, and Erdos, and they, they managed to combine these ideas to prove that uh, it's enough to take and it is at least three times k squared times s. So of course, I'm not giving here uh, full proofs by any means. I'm just telling you like what is the extra idea or extra ingredient that uh, each, each one of these groups introduced to derive the result. Okay. So what is the situation? Uh, when can you hope to improve uh, upon this argument? So here is kind of the case. So suppose, we have, so let, let me consider like an extremal case. No uh, vertices with moderately high degree. And let's make it a bit quantitative. What can you say about such families? Okay. And here comes the pipeline of, uh, of this whole talk. So what, we, what did we do, uh, at least in the HLS proof? What we did here is really an increase of measure by forcing a single VI to be in the family. Uh, so in other words, what the HLS did is they increased density by fixing VI. Um, I.e., when you look at this FI and you normalize the size but why it should be, you get much more than what to be. 
cd by some constant factor even, you are done. Then you can easily prove whatever you want. So can we uh, use some other methods to increase our density? And the answer is yes. We've seen them. So, uh, So we've seen that in general, uh, you can increase density by either restricting constantly many variables or going from p to one plus a little bit times p. And here we're talking about testing systems that are uniform. So what you need to do is, uh, is look at uh, the upper shadow from K to say one plus, F, F, uh, one plus alpha K. Yeah. It's really the same thing. So I don't want to make separate notation or anything like that, but it's really the same thing. So let's go back to the corollary. So yeah, so I'm talking about really, I'm talking about this corollary that we've seen in the beginning of the talk. Uh, yeah, so let me now uh, connect it all. Let's see why we need small degrees to make that strategy happen. Uh, so why is this useful? So, uh, so we have this, and by the corollary, We can increase the density by either fixing constantly many variables or increasing k. Okay, so let's say that we can do it by fixing some variables. Then this is good. Then what we can do is we can take our first family to be this restricted family. Okay. And so maybe I should, maybe I should clarify the notation here. And so by that I mean just the family where um, it's a little bit of a mess, I'm sorry. Just the family of subsets of n minus r. Well, if I insert r, I get something from the family. Okay. Good. So, so then what I can do is take my first family to be this restricted family. But then I should be careful. Then I'm not allowed to use these vertices from r in any one of the elements from the matching. So I need to proceed with uh, f prime, which is, uh, let's call, say f, when r is restricted to zero, i.e. I need to forbid uh, containing anything from r. Okay, and the key point is that this family remains large. And why is that? Well, we throw away everything that contains one of the variables from R essentially in F prime. So you can compute and you can show that the size of F prime is at least the size of F minus the number of variables uh, we reduced times the degree of each one of these variables. And this is the reason we need them to be small. Okay. And what you can do is you can show that this is something small. And actually, even you, if you multiply it by s, it's still small with uh, respect to the size of the family. Okay. 
So this means that we can uh, proceed with the argument on F prime, apply the corollary again, find another bump, and so on and so forth. Okay, so this is the idea. And uh, Doris, sorry, what do you mean when you say if i is bigger than hundred f? Uh, yeah. So, so remember this corollary told us. Okay. No, no, okay. The measure. The measure. You mean? The measure. The measure. Yeah. I'm sorry. I confused it. Thank you. The density is increasing. Yeah. So, so you apply this color iteratively, you find uh, these restrictions or, so you also need to bump up the measure sometimes, but it's not a big deal. Uh, this is sort of the bigger uh, headache. So you can apply this iteratively, you can find these bumps by factor 100. And as I told you, once you increase, once in this question, once you manage to increase your uh, density by some constant factor, 100 will do. Then you can use some different arguments to argue that you contain an S matching. Okay, so this is the new ingredient that we have in our proof. Uh, but of course, what I said now only applies when you have no degrees of moderate degree. So again, you need to interpolate between maybe there are 10 variables with high degree, 20 with moderate, and so on. But you can do it. It's not uh, it's not too bad. But it still requires some uh, some effort. Uh, yeah. So I think that this is all I had to say. So if there are any questions, this is a good time. <laughs> okay. So uh, maybe one question. So this was the case when you have a. Uh have an influential coalition, kind of. Uh, yeah. Uh, and you're saying that in case you don't, uh, you just uh, increase, you look at the upper shadow and you apply the uh, argument for larger k. Yeah. So it's important that we use this, that this property is monotone. If I find an S matching in the shadow, then it's also an S matching where it came from. So this yeah. is why it's, it's, it's not a big deal. Mm -hmm. right. Any questions from the, from someone else? I have one more thing. I mean, it would be nice if you, I think, mention this, this extended hypergraphs. Um, yeah, it might be uh, to see. I, I don't know if you want to do that. Yeah, so, so I'll say it in in a, in a some level. Okay. So what is an expanded hypergraph? So suppose we have some graph D with constant degree. Then the K expansion of of G is denoted by g plus of k. So what do you do? So let me draw it. So we have some edges in g. So what you do is you define a k-uniform hypergraph where to each one of the edges of g, you add a fresh new k minus two vertices. So you can clearly see that expanded hypergraphs generalize matchings, right? So if the G matching, then G plus of K 
Ils avaient quand même eu le fond en maths. So you can study uh, this question as well. You can study uh, or given G. What is the size of, or oh, what is the maximum size oh, how large a family of subsets B there is no copy of the G, of this G class. Okay. So, uh, so you can clearly see that this question generalizes the Erdos matching conjecture because it's, uh, the Erdos matching conjecture is just a simple case of it. Uh, but you can look for a more general answer. And uh, so we have uh, two results with respect to that. Uh, yeah, so, so for that, I need to define uh, like one definition. So the cost cut of G is uh, the minimal sigma G. So that you can find a set of vertices in the expanded graph of size sigma g that intersects each edge in exactly one vertex. Okay. And so what we can show is that this cost cut number behaves very similarly to the S in the Erdos matching conjecture in the sense that uh, the answer to this question is that F is of size one plus minus epsilon times the family that you get uh, when, when you plug in S equals to sigma. Okay, so this is something we can prove. So we can prove that, uh, at least asymptotically, this is a, this is the parameter that uh, characterizes the, uh, the answer to this question. And for some uh, class of graphs, we can show that uh, you don't need this epsilon. But again, this is all for only for uh, G that are uh, of boundary degree. Yeah, so, so that's that's this answer. Yeah, yeah that's good. Uh -huh. the, the, the only thing that uh, I want to ask is G, you think of it, you, you start with the graph necessarily or any bounded hypergraph, bounded uniformity hypergraph, or you can start even with a high uniformity hypergraph. Yes, so right now I only formulated it for normal graph, but you can take any bounded uniformity hypergraph. Mm -hmm. But not uh, not unbounded uniformity hypergraph. No, no, it's important for the proof. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, so if that's all, I think that I'll stop here. Yeah. Uh, just in case, any other questions? Well, if not, yeah, well, thanks a lot, Dor. It was uh, interesting, and you, well, you did tell something interesting for me as well. And I'm sure you told uh, some interesting stuff for, for the audience. Thank you. Uh, 
Yeah. Take a look at the cover that you had. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks.